the Paul Leslie Interviews. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to our interview with Alexi Igudisman and Hyung Ki Ju. Thank you, gentlemen, so much for joining us from across the seas. It's a big pleasure. It's a huge pleasure. Enormous. Normally on the radio, I ask guests the question, who are you? Like, who is Alexi Igudisman? But since I have both of you, I want you to describe the other person. Oh, that's <laughs> very, very crafty. Good yeah, one, very Paul. Mean, very, very nice one. Very nice one. It's, it's, it's a good idea. It's a good idea. Well, so well why Alexi, don't you start? I, I will start and not make it too horrible. So, you know, it doesn't leave much room for Alexei to be so horrible. Um, Alexei Gudesman is basically my first wife. Although when we first met at the age of 12, it was not love at first sight. It was hate at first sight. And I'm not kidding here, but Alexei used to beat me up for almost a good year. And Okay, um, when you say first wife, that means that you're, actually, uh, you're actually happily married with a beautiful lady. Uh, but we see each other so often that it is, uh, yes. Yes, that's, that's what I mean by Alexei. That has to be corrected because you know, there can be misunderstandings there. As you can see, you can already, you listeners can already tell the sort of vibe of our marriage, of our relationship, that he doesn't even let me talk, and uh, he's interrupting me already. So as I, I was like saying... As much as you like, you can talk all day. No, no, I don't actually have that much to say about you. I don't have I that love, much to say about you. I love the sound of your voice. <laughs> <laughs> no, Alexei is my uh, partner in crime, and although we've never committed any crimes illegally... Uh, we have been friends ever since I offered him a portion of fish and chips at the age of 13, and I asked him to stop beating me up. And we realized from an early age on that we had a lot of similar aspirations about how we felt about music and classical music in particular. We've been firm writing partners now for about uh, seven years and uh, touring quite intensively for the last four or five years. Mm, yes, yeah, very interesting. It's not really about me, but uh, thank you very much. It was very... <laughs> okay, well, Mr. Jew is a wonderful, wonderful human being. He is, in fact, my sole partner in many, many ways in music. He's an incredible pianist, a wonderful musician, a great humanitarian. <laughs> Shall I go on? <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> He is actually, uh, Mr. Yankee Jew is actually the first Korean Jew that I've ever met. So, Happy New Year to you, first of all. Basically, Thank you very much. It, yeah, indeed. No, but the, really, the truth is we are two passionate musicians who have uh, maybe a little bit too much of a wicked sense of humor. And uh, we, at a certain point in our lives, we just realized that classical music or the whole thing, the whole scene of classical music is just taking itself way too seriously, and, and that has to be turned on its head. So um, this is kind of our mission from God. I wanted to ask first, Mr. Ju, uh, tell me yes. about the early music that you listened to. Your favorites. I presume when you mean early music, you don't actually, you're not actually referring to the Renaissance and Baroque. You actually mean early music as far as when I was a toddler, when I was a baby, yeah, it, right? It's, it's what you listen to at five in the morning, I think he means. <laughs> <laughs> Though I don't personally recollect my early years, my parents told me that I would listen to music nonstop. In fact, and this I do remember, I remember we were, when we were all going shopping and I would pass a store, a record store, where they were playing music, I would just freeze. And I would be, I would not want to move. I would not want to go from that store. And my parents had no choice but to ask the store owner if they could just look after me for a half an hour or so while they quickly did their shopping. And I just uh, stayed in that store and I just listened to everything. And I, um, I, I would ask them, put this on, put that on. And I guess they would rather not have a five-year-old crying. So I listened to everything, really everything from jazz, pop, classical. I loved it all. And what about you, Mr. Goodisman? What, what were you listening to? Oh, uh, you know, uh, Britney Spears, 
No, just kidding. Uh, I, well, I do appreciate some of her songs. I, I, I was also, I was very eclectic in my, in my uh, listening, or, or, always since I'm a kid. Also, I always used to love, of course, I loved the classical, you know, the classical music, classics, so to speak, you know, from Mozart to Beethoven. But I, pretty early on, I was fascinated by Queen, by Pink Floyd, by, you know, by many great pop music, musicians, also jazz, world music, every type of music. And for, for me, and I think for us, there's only good and great music, really. I mean, we really appreciate all music that is good of quality to us, of course. It's a personal taste. But uh, I think that, that that's kind of the name of the game for us in, in our shows as well. It's based on classical music, but we do have always, we, we like to mix it up. In, in I wouldn't call it crossover because it has such a negative side. It sounds a little bit too negative these days because it's, it sounds like it's popularized. But I think we just love to cross the genres in order to see the similarities between the different genres. So uh, that's part of the excitement for us. So tell me about the first time that you guys came together. And I mean musically. Was it... <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. But <laughs> when you guys came together musically, did you guys feel like, yeah, we've got something? Yeah, well... Well, first of all, we felt like we've got a headache because we, we used to beat each other up, just like Yankee said. But I, I, of course, after a while, we really realized that we have something special together because of the mix of the styles, but also because of our love for theater and for comedy. Isn't that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we, uh, we went to a school called the Yehudi Menuhin School in England, and so... We, of course, grew up a lot with the British comedy. and uh, But, of course, we were watching the great American comedians as well. And, like Alexei said, we had a fantastic drama teacher at the Yehudi Menuhin School. His name was Kevin Jones, and we, he was really great. He, he opened us to a whole other world, and, and, we, and he took us to the theater, and we saw plays. And we also did plays at school. Alexei was in Beckett's Waiting for Godot. I was in Ballad of the Sad Cafe. And, and, I, I was uh, Godot. I was Godot. <laughs> yes, I, I think those years that were really formative and much of the inspiration from that time still lasts today. I mean, there are even some things in our present show, A Little Nightmare Music, that are just almost direct transcripts of what we did already back then in our teenage years. Well, tell everybody a little more about that, the A Little Nightmare Music show that you guys do well the the thing is it's very difficult to describe without seeing it i mean we sometimes like to call it mozart meets monty python basically it's, it's it, it it is a classical concert but it's a classical concert where everything goes wrong on purpose and hence the title to... nightmare Exactly, yeah. And you don't need to have any kind of knowledge of classical music beforehand. It's, um, it, of course, it, you know, it's, it's a funny show. We, we are actually funny on stage. I'm, I'm sorry. Anyway, and, but basically we love things going wrong. And we've noticed actually that very often in concert halls, when you go to a classical performance of, uh, or any kind of performance really, when something goes wrong, this is when, when the audience really starts to listen. Suddenly... A mobile phone rings and people are flabbergasted and appalled, but people are actually awake for once. So we planned a whole lot of things that may or may not go wrong into the show. And we cannot actually say too many things. Otherwise, you know, you, you wouldn't be so surprised when you go and see it. I see. So you guys have gotten the chance to perform together in many different places. It's really quite astounding the, the number of places around the world you guys have been able to perform could you guys between the two of you could you pick mm. a favorite place that you guys have performed wow i mean there are so many places i mean that we we love performing in the u.s because the the audiences in the u.s are just so warm and receptive and and they're I, just ready to I, have a, such a great laugh I, I think it's probably the most open, open public that we've had. I thought we've got a great public everywhere, but in the U.S. And we had, an, I, I have to say, the U.S., uh, the New York performance we had uh, last year at the 92nd Street Y was just amazing. I mean, the audience, it was screaming with laughter, but next second it was as quiet, so quiet and listening to every single note that we were playing. So 
I think what if, happens what happens yeah. in our show is though it's filled with all kinds of for want of a better word jokes let's say there is also music that's seriously played and and one thing that's very important for people that may not have seen us live or seen us on YouTube is that we don't we're not making fun of the music we're having fun with the music and this is a very very important distinction for us and we noticed that for example a lot of the audiences that come to our show i mean first of all people have to realize that just like you said our show is really open to anybody we have had kids at our show we've had people we've had three generations we, we've had grandmother several mother and daughter several, several times, times. We, we have photos to prove it, actually. The, the granddaughter, the mother, and the gra uh, grandmother. We haven't had a great-grandmother there yet. So No, yeah, so not yet. Not yet. But we also have people who are classical music connoisseurs, and we also have people who have never even heard of classical music or have never even walked into a concert hall. And so it's a very exciting mix. And wherever we've played in the world, it's always going to be very different. Actually, it differs from city to city. It's hard to generalize. It's hard to even pinpoint and say a country, an audience from a particular country reacts in such a way because you just go to the next town an hour away and, and it's already very different. And that's great for us because we love to try and fit in, so to speak. We love to try and react to what we're feeling from the audience and seeing where they're going and what they're laughing at. So that turns us on. Mr. Jew, I'd like to ask you also about the album that you recorded with Billy Joel. Yes. Tell us about that experience. I mean, any experience that, that Alexei and I have outside of all our projects and shows as a good as mine and Jew is only gives us more inspiration for what we do. Obviously, working with a musician that's as wonderful as Billy and he's so open and actually, the great thing about working with Billy is that he has a fantastic sense of humor, and he's an absolute, he's absolutely madly in love with classical music. So I guess that's why we both got along. And actually, he's even inspired us for some skits. And we recently, Alexei and I, we recently did an arrangement of one of his songs, and we didn't tell him about it. He came to our show at the Newport Music Festival, and we just surprised him. We said, oh, our next piece is a little arrangement of one of Billy Joel's songs. Oh, and he happens to be here in the audience, and let's see what happens. So, and he liked it very much. It was a very, very special experience for me because this man has so much love and warmth for classical music, and he wants to do so much for classical music, very similarly to what Alexei and I want to do. So we were all both on the same, uh, same path. This question is for Alexei. Yes. On the violin, who are your biggest influences? Oh, that's manifold, actually, as well. I think definitely one of the biggest influences I had a big pleasure with playing with for several years. We, we had a show together as a good as manager with uh, Gidon Kramer. And we, we toured together with Gidon and his orchestra. We actually wrote a, sh a show around Gidon called Being Gidon Kramer, where I gave Gidon a, a violin lesson and, and, you know, all sorts of little episodes, fictional episodes from his life and, and things from the recording studio and, and making music with him was just a dream come true. So he's definitely a big influence. Of course, also an influence, I have to say, is Julian Rachlin, who uh, is a, you know, wonderful Russian, Lithuanian, Jewish, Austrian violinist, <laughs> a great performer. And he's actually our oldest friend. He's based in Vienna and we see him a lot. And, and we play very often at his uh, festival in Dubrovnik. We just played there right now. The great thing is in recent years, we've become very close friends with a lot of violinists and we've we've got a, sh a show coming up where we are featuring Victoria Mulova the wonderful Russian violinist who is also participating in doing some crazy and fun things with us. Otherwise, I think these days uh, there's many wonderful violinists who I even love now. I mean, they're, they're influences now in a way because uh, they're friends, but yet again, they play so wonderfully. Joshua Bell is a friend, Janine Janssen, there's so, so many around. And maybe of the old style violinists, hmm, one of the violinists I love the most, I think both of us love the most, is Jeanette Neveu. Wonderful French violinist. This next question is for Mr. Jew. What is something about Alexei 
that would surprise us. <laughs> but there's something about Alexei that would not surprise you. <laughs> you know what? Even if you see Alexei on stage, and even if you would fall in love with him, and even if you would find him hilarious, nothing that he does on stage compares to how he is in real life. This man is scarily funny in real life if he doesn't realize that anyone is watching him. So that's, <laughs> that's my answer to that. You'd have to see me. I'm, uh, on radio, I don't look so good. Well, I think you know which question is coming next for Alexi. Yes. What's something about Mr. Jew that would surprise us? Well, <laughs> yes, well, many Go things. Go for it. Don't hold back. Go for it. <laughs> well, uh, I don't know. I mean, he is, I think that what might surprise you is that he is the world's fastest toothbrusher in the world. I think not many That's people true. know that. That is but true. But he, he holds the unofficial world record for two things, actually, for the fastest toothbrushing and for the most amount of different laughs. This man has so many different types of laughs. It's it's not even it's not even funny. Uh, in fact, uh, I mean, we're working on a new show called "And Now Mozart," hopefully to come out next year. And I I hope that he he's working on a number right now where he's going to incorporate all these different laughs into one single number. So this number might last a couple of hours. <laughs> for the last question, this is for both of you. Yes. For anyone who's listening to this broadcast, wherever they are in the world, what would you like to say to all the people who are listening in? <laughs> well, we would love to say that you have to, I mean, all of this, all of our ranting on is nothing like us being on stage. So the best would be just to come uh, and see us perform or see us on YouTube, actually. That's one of the things that we're really grateful for. I mean, we've been watched now over 25 million times on YouTube, which is extraordinary for us because it, it just opens so many, so many doors to so many people outside the classical music world. You can see us in the US plenty live. We're, we'll be coming back. We love our fans. We love to sign photographs afterwards. We take pictures. We spend seven hours afterwards partying with our fans. <laughs> it's, it's a wild ride. Anything to add, Mr. Jew? I, no, abs no, that, that's it. You you said everything on my list. I, I was just ticking them, ticking them along as you said it. Well, let me ask you this then, Mr. Jew. Do you have any yes. words of wisdom, like, and let it be? You know, it's it's very hard for me to be original because I have to admit that I listened quite recently to your wonderful interview with Jeff Daniels. And I really, really enjoyed that. And he, he just stole the show in my mind. So I, I thought that what he had to say at the end of your interview, which was to fall in love with tomorrow, I mean, you can't beat that. So that's yeah, just that's just... That. So why don't you just repeat that? Go on, just say the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Not everybody... So I, I, you know, I think one of the things that's kept me sane for many years is something which I came up with, which is that not everyone loves chocolate. I don't know how wise that is, but it's helped me through, through difficult times. So whenever someone has not been appreciative of anything that I've said or done, I just think, well, not everybody likes chocolate. Not that I'm comparing myself to chocolate. But, uh... <laughs> but you are very, very sweet. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, so I think that's, that's the saying for today. Not everyone likes chocolate. I like that, actually. I like that a lot. Well, gentlemen, I have enjoyed. I like both of you. So well, thank, thank you, you so thank you very much. much. This is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> we, 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 we will pick this up when you are in Atlanta. Fantastic. Sounds fantastic. Perfect. All right. Let's do that. All right, gentlemen. Goodbye. Thank you so much, Paul. Okay. Bye -bye. All right. Bye-bye.